PESA Plus is our NAFTA. It basically opens up all the Pacific markets to Australia and New Zealand. And yeah, it doesn't give us too much in return. Uh, so yeah, these kinds of things, uh, Bitcoin cannot fix that. Uh, a lot of um, what will come of Bitcoin uh, may be able to fix that. When Pacific nations become little Dubois, then yeah, even though we're still categorized by the UN as SIDS, small island developing states, they have a section for us every September at the UN General Assembly in New York, all the SIDS have their own little functions. Uh, hopefully we'll gradually make it back into the main forum where we discuss things with everyone else and not just sent off to the children's table. <laughs> Welcome to Bitcoin Basics with your hosts, Faris and Gordon. Visit bitcoinbasics.help if you need help buying and securing your Bitcoin. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Bitcoin Basics podcast. It is Faris and Gordon here. We are recording on the 6th of June, 2022. The price of Bitcoin is $31,220. The block height is 739,506 and Satoshi's per dollar is 3,203. Now, Gordon, we just finished a really wonderful and just mind blowing interview with Lord Fatsui of Tonga. Um, I don't know if I'm going to sleep tonight. There's so many things that are going to go through my head with this one. And unfortunately, due to our time commitments, we have to cut it short. But man, that was a lot of fun. Yeah, it sure was. And we're, we're probably butchering his name too. So apologies for advance in that. Um, he, I mean, he, he just has an amazing life story, just personally himself, mm. uh, Tonga as well. But, um, you know, you'll hear in the interview, um, this was a long one, but an amazing one. And we could have mm. gone on for hours and hours and hours. But as we said in the interview, this is where the rubber hits the road. This is where Bitcoin mm helps uh, individuals and helps sovereign nations like uh, Tonga um, developing, merging. I'm not sure what the political correct term is nowadays, but this is where it's at. So, you know, we talk a lot on our show about Bitcoin basics, you know, how to move your Bitcoin from an exchange to a hardware wallet. Mm. And all that stuff is important, don't get me wrong, but this is where it really affects lives. This is where it can actually make social change. So, Super exciting uh, to hear mm. about what they've planned already, uh, see what they've planned, and we'll have him back on another six months. So, uh. Yeah, and just another personal note. Right? So Laura Fastui is running um, this, like, he's doing these interviews from a hospital bed. He had three, not near-death experience, actual death actual experiences. clinical deaths, yeah. Yeah, three times clinically dead. He's lost a, a femur in his right leg. Um, he's and in the middle of it, like he could barely move. He said he could only lift one hand. And what did he do? He went down the rabbit, Bitcoin rabbit hole and he's bringing Bitcoin to a sovereign state to help his people increase their GDP by 30% um, at least right away. So um, this is a man who, you know, could be looking after his own health and just ignoring everyone else's needs, but he is working tirelessly for his own people. And this is just inspirational to us. An amazing story. Yeah, so without further ado, here's the interview. And uh, we, again, really appreciate his time. And we'll definitely catch up with him mm -hmm. in another six months to see um, how everything's going. So, If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, like, and share so we can find others like yourself. Thank you for tuning in, everyone. Now, Gordon and I tend to have a policy where we don't do too much research before these podcasts because we like to come in fresh. We figured you, the listeners, are listening to Bitcoin Basics because you're learning the basics. So if me and Gordon do a lot of research, we have that presumptive knowledge. Um, so we try not to do too much research about our guests or the topics that we discuss. Uh, this case, we didn't do that. We were both very, very excited to speak to Lord... Um, now, how do we pronounce your name correctly, Lord? I want to get that right. Uh, Fusitua. Fusitua. Yep. So in this case, we kind of ignored our own internal policies, and we went ahead and right. listened to several of your previous podcasts because 
Uh, this one and previous podcast that we did with Bitcoin Exashi, where he's running a Bitcoin Beach program, these are real world case scenarios. So we're just not talking to someone who is giving advice on buying and trading Bitcoin or stuff that's happening in you know the US or Europe, which is great. But this is actually something that you are doing, which is making a real world on the grounds difference to people's lives. So yeah, we kind of, as sure. you will pick up soon in this interview, I kind of was like a um, lap dog, just, <laughs> just drooling at the book because this was an interview I was really excited to do. So we're back in. And um, so we didn't do this, but do you mind just giving everyone just a brief background as to who you are and what you're trying yep. to do with Bitcoin and Tonga? No worries. Uh, yep. So my name's uh, Lord Fusitua. I'm from uh, a small country, a small island kingdom in the Pacific uh, called Tonga. Uh, so Tonga is um, uh, a kingdom, constitutional monarchy, uh, and has been so for a while now. Uh, we've been ruled by the same royal family uh, for the past 1,400 years. Uh, so we became a full democracy in 2010. Um, that's uh, where we're from. We're, along with uh, Ethiopia, we're the only uh, BIPOC nations never to have been colonised. So that's why we're still uh, the only kingdom remaining in the Pacific. Uh, I myself uh, am a barrister by trade. Uh, intellectual property, finance, and banking law. Uh, I began, uh, I had my training um, at the Australian National University in Canberra, which is actually where I was born and raised. Uh, so ANU Law School, and then practiced law, uh, both uh, in barristers' chambers uh, and for legal aid in Canberra, before I ended up moving back to Tonga. So uh, barrister and solicitor of the ACT Supreme Court, barrister of the High Court of Australia, um, went back into, uh, went back to Tonga. Uh, my father uh, ordered me back to uh, take up my duties uh, at the early 2000s. So yeah, gave up my uh, dream of, uh, a silver 911 and a house at Point Piper uh, for Tonga uh, and earning 7K a year as a Crown Counsel working for the government uh, mm. as a prosecutor. Um, worked as a prosecutor for a while and then uh, was moved across to administration. Uh, when I, I left Tonga, uh, I went on... Uh, a Ministry of Justice scholarship. Uh, my parents uh, could have uh, paid for me to go, but uh, I was able to win a scholarship. So that's what I did. And that's why, uh, even though I wanted to practice law as a trial lawyer, uh, being a prosecutor, I was taken back by the Ministry of Justice uh, to help administer the courts uh, and ended up as Deputy Secretary of Justice uh, for Tonga, uh, and then uh, I married my now ex-wife uh, and began working uh, as general counsel for her mother's company, a company called Tongasat, which was Tonga's uh, satellite company that leased satellite slots in space uh, to other countries and to companies. Um, under ITU, International Telecommunications Law, only a sovereign nation can uh, register satellite slots. Um, but a friend of our kings, uh, King Tupo IV, His Late Majesty, uh, who worked at Intelsat, uh, spoke to the king during the 80s and uh, noted to him uh, that the five eyes in China had uh, gone to sleep, as it were, over the 70s and 80s and had not registered all the prime slots from about Pakistan and India through China, Southeast Asia, over the Pacific Ocean to the west coast of the United States. Most of those prime slots had not been registered. 
mainly because there's a gentleman's agreement uh, at international law that you won't register a slot unless you can put a bird up there. Uh, so what Tom and I did was it preempted that and we registered all the slots we could get our hands on um, across that frequency spectrum. So even though, of course, there's no way we could afford to put a, a satellite up uh, legally, those slots were now ours. So anyone uh, ended up being the Chinese Communist Party, uh, the Chinese government, uh, Boeing, um, a number of other companies, tech companies, the NSA, all these people who wanted slots over the Pacific had to um, lease them from us. So I worked as the general counsel uh, for that company, doing the legal negotiations for um, the leasing of those slots. Uh, eventually, um, I moved back into private practice after my ex-wife and I parted ways. Uh, I moved uh, into corporate practice, which is my specialty, even though I'd become a prosecutor. Uh, my specialty is, as I said, intellectual property, uh, banking and finance laws. So I went back into corporate practice uh, and became a lawyer for a number of multinationals uh, for their branch in Tonga. Um, ironically, uh, and I still am, uh, the lawyer on retainer for Federal Pacific Finance and Fexco Pacific, who own Western Union uh, for about two thirds of the Pacific. So yeah, uh, I had to end up disclosing to them uh, my advocacy uh, for Bitcoin. So I was presented with a choice of a fat retainer check every January or setting my whole country financially free. That's obviously a no brainer choice. I chose the latter. Um, uh, I'm still on good terms with them. They are personal <laughs> friends. The people that own the company, they knew it wasn't personal. It's, uh, yeah, it's a matter of uh, principle. I, I believe yeah. my people have a right to financial freedom. <laughs> Uh, so it didn't cost the friendship. Uh, and then about a decade ago, my father passed. Uh, as per our constitution, I inherited the title, uh, the Fustua title. So I became Lord Fustua uh, and inherited the estates which come with that title uh, and therefore became eligible uh, to be a Lord Member of Parliament to represent the constituency from which those estates uh, founded. Uh, my father had happened to be the sitting Lord member at the time. So his seat was vacated upon his passing. Uh, we had to have a by-election where the Lords in my constituency uh, voted me in uh, and have done so ever since for the past decade until November last year, where I vacated my seat. Uh, due to medical reasons. I'd been abroad for medical treatment for a couple of years. Uh, and during that medical treatment, uh, I fell back down the rabbit hole uh, and reacquainted myself with Bitcoin in a major way. Uh, and um, I had read the white paper back in 2013 and thought uh, I understood it well. Um, as with most of us, I found out much later that I had not gotten my head around it at all uh, and understood it more thoroughly much later with much more uh, research uh, and investigation. And I discovered, uh, as everyone has, that Bitcoin is the most pristine asset that man has ever devised, that the digital scarcity that Steve Wozniak uh, has observed uh, can only ever be discovered once. And Bitcoin is Bitcoin because of that uh, digital scarcity discovery. Uh, and discovered that, yeah, it's uh, the most supreme store of value. Uh, as my friend Michael Saylor says it's better at being fiat than fiat is, it's better at being gold than gold is. Uh, so for people that look like me in the OECD G7 
G20 nations uh, who had been marginalised from access to capital markets because uh, they couldn't afford it or they've been gate kept or uh, they were redlined from real estate markets, which are the basis of foundation of generational wealth in Western middle class society, uh, uh, especially out of America. Uh, there was a new asset that had no barriers to entry, zero barriers to entry. So my Bitcoin uh, is just as good as Elon Musk's Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So for someone in an OECD nation, they could find generational wealth for lineages of people who had previously been, uh, had no access to capital markets at all. And for those who had access to capital markets, it was even better for them. Uh, but I also discovered that for those of us in emerging markets, the four plus nearly 5 billion of us in emerging markets, Bitcoin's a life-saving technology. It will, it's salvation for us from uh, hyperinflation in Nigeria and Venezuela, uh, where they need a wheelbarrow full of their own currency to buy a loaf of bread. Uh, and for those of us in GDP remittance dependent countries, where a large part of our GDP is dependent on remittances and therefore dependent on the price gouging of the remittance industry, uh, it saves us from that. Were we to use Bitcoin, it would be our salvation from that value scraping that's done by the remittance industry and uh, the predatory commercial banks. So, Did yeah, that brought me to here. Sorry. Yep. No, I was just going to, I mean, you're a politician, I think, so that uh, you'd probably talk for three hours if we didn't interrupt you. I'm a politician <laughs> and a barrister. You have to Oh, there go. you go. <laughs> uh, only joking. Um, you have a fascinating <laughs> personal journey, and I'll get back to that in a minute, but I've always been fascinated with something like Western Union, you know, that remittance industry, and everyone knows Western Union. What, what do they think about Bitcoin? And do you think they'll ever adopt it? Or is it just always going to be enemy number one? Well, Jack Mallers said something which is quite reserved. He said, Western Union would charge you $1 if they could afford to. Um, at least 50% of the reason they charge you what they charge you is because it's very expensive for them to get the money to you. There are about, between you and El Salvador, and um, the US remitter, Jack Mallers talking to Peter McCormack attested to a minimum of 11 intermediaries between sending it from New York to actually getting Whoa. it to New So Western Union has to get it through those 11 intermediaries. And that's why they have to charge a lot. That's not oh. all the reason, a lot of it's greed still, but that's mm. one of the reasons. So, Partially, they charge that much because they have to. Partially, they charge that much because they're gouging for profit. Mm. So you may not have seen MoneyGram last week is going uh, into uh, partnership, I think, with the Solana blockchain to try and make <laughs> use of crypto remittances. Yeah, exactly. Um, but they are investigating... Uh, working with El Salvador, if they can match... So El Salvador's back-end is done by OpenNode. I know that because they've approached me to do our back-end in time. Mm. If MoneyGram can work with OpenNode and make it cost-effective for them, they will send remittances to El Salvador on Bitcoin on Lightning. Mm. So mm. I'll send you guys the link to the article. It's an interesting Fantastic. article. Yeah. So... The option is there for those remitters. If they want to, they can do what um, Jack Mellers has done with Strike. Effectively, it will become a race to zero because people will eventually go, mm -hmm. we can send bit, uh, remittances for nothing. Why are we going to use Western Union again? Mm -hmm. So Jack Mellers has already made it uh, for people in the US and El Salvador 
Um, that's where Strike works at the moment. You can send Bitcoin for zero fees. So, so with sorry, sorry, go ahead. with that, so obviously Bitcoin for Tonga solves a remittance issue, and you'll save a lot of money doing so. Are you looking at potentially a future Bitcoin economy in Tonga? Because I mean, you are solving the remittance issue, but are you looking beyond that? Is um, by being a Bitcoin open um, sovereign state, are you looking at potentially bringing in jobs, bringing in um, digital nomads? Is that on the horizon as well? Yeah, hundred percent. The entire um, the entire uh, spectrum of Bitcoin solutions uh, we are open to a hundred percent. So everything that Bitcoin can bring, which uh, is jobs, digital nomads, uh, Bitcoin mining at a nation state level, uh, purchasing Bitcoin, everything that El Salvador is doing, um, we are open to. So if you guys make me co-host, I can show you uh, sort of um, what the four-step plan is. Right. I just need to be co-host so I can share my screen. Okay. We'll take a pause and recording. Oh, yep. Uh, no, you can keep recording. Okay. Yep. So, where are we? So, obviously, the first step is the commercial um, solution, which is uh, changing re GDP remittance dependence. So, we reclaim that 30% of GDP. So, everyone in the country gets 30% extra income. Okay. So, in informal in emerging markets economies like Tonga, if informal economies that don't have a high level of manufacturing or professional industries, the government doesn't make their money from income tax. So they impose what's called a consumption tax on all consumer goods so that you make money even if you're uh, a cash-based fisher or farmer in the village. You still have to pay tax when you buy a stick of gum or you buy a net. So the 15% that government charges, if the whole country suddenly has 30% extra disposable income, they're going to spend that 30% into government's 15%. So government's 15% gets a 30% injection of new capital from overseas that wasn't there before. So the money that goes to hospitals, roads and schools from the government's 15% suddenly gets a 30% bump as well, right across the board. So that's the second win. The third win is that the fisherman or farmer in the village who lives on 150 bucks a week, he now gets the 400 instead of 70 bucks in his remittance. So his natural tendency will be to increase his standard of living. So his kids go to school with breakfast now instead of without breakfast. Uh, maybe he can afford an extra net if he's a fisherman, an extra hour of uh, a tractor's time if he's a farmer. But eventually he's going to go, I got by on $70 instead of 100 It was hand to mouth, but I got by. So if I budget and try and get by on the $70 again, for the first time in the history of my family, there'll be someone who can afford savings. So that extra 30% 30 then becomes savings. So that can become savings, which will educate their children and eventually he'll get better jobs and uplift the family, or that 30% can build up their uh, fishing or farming small business so that they are finally able to put away money for generational wealth. Um, yeah, it's, that's the third win. And then the fourth win is, remember they're saving 30%, but they're not saving it in, um, even in the strongest fiat, USD, which melts at 5% per annum. 
they're saving it in a protocol that appreciates at 200% per annum CAGR, cumulative annual growth rate, year on year mm. since its inception. So their 30 bucks to Bitcoin this year could be 60, could be 90 bucks next year. So that's the fourth win. So that's just from the remittances. Instant and effectively free. The second part of the plan is, of course, you go legal tender so that they can uh, spend and save those remittances they're sent. Yeah. So before uh, legal tender is reached, um, sorry, before legal tender is reached, we will need um, an off ramp for the remittances. So I had to take um, a part interest in uh, effectively a crypto bank. Okay. So the reason I had to do that was that it provides um, it provides me with access to these are more um, OECD nation products. So DeFi Market Swap, which is the company that I own, uh, similar to uh, Celsius, you can get uh, collateralize your, bit, your Bitcoin and get a home loan. But more importantly, is it gives me a Visa card that I can give for free to every Tongan so that they can get the remittances sent directly to um, the wallet on our proprietary app. So they can get the Bitcoin sent directly to the uh, DeFi market wallet, which is connected to the Visa card, and they can then spend the Bitcoin natively. So there's no charge for going uh, changing Bitcoin into fiat. You send the remittance from Sydney or Auckland directly to uh, that person's wallet address and it's automatically spendable. I'm not sure if you've heard of the Wirex card, which a lot of people uh, in emerging markets use, which is RSP. a release. I use one myself. Yeah. There you go. So <laughs> this is similar, except with us, you don't have to make that exchange into fiat to spend yeah. you just spend yeah. uh, it natively now is so, that is that bitcoin so, only or can i transfer my uh, juicy uh, xrp and lunar tokens oh uh, you're saying you're the sacrilege good <laughs> lord i'm um, being sarcastic by the way yeah so it's yeah. DeFi. Uh, yeah DeFi. so yeah, there are, you can send other uh, currencies as well. I couldn't keep it Bitcoin only. Uh, I had to make some compromises for the other parties who are part owners in the company. Uh, I, so, so until then, until this is legal tender, um, the off-ramp will have to be the Visa card. Once it's legal tender... Mm -hmm. It's all right. You can spend the Bitcoin uh, yourself. So uh, legal tender is step two. Step three then is the mining. So, wow. so El Salvador does Bitcoin mining because it's uh, clean, renewable energy. Uh, so that means your electricity costs, which is your major overhead when you're a miner, because I'm a miner myself personally. Uh, I have a couple of terahash uh, worth of Bitcoin miners. So what do you do uh, if you're a Tonga? So if you're a Tonga, you have 21 volcanoes for a population of only 100,000. So that makes one volcano uh, just... As a trivia spot, that new off over there, that's my estate. That's the island I own. So, um, 21 volcanoes, population of 100,000, that means one volcano for every 5,000 people. So, it only takes two megawatts of electricity to service 5,000 people. 
So 5,000 times 20 is 100,000. That's our population. Two times 20, that's 40. So it only takes 40 megawatts for our entire national grid. Now, each of these volcanoes will produce 95 megawatts. So that's 2,000 megawatts. Wow. So we produce 2,000 megawatts. We only need 40. What do we do with the rest? With 400 mm -hmm. megawatts, we provide every family in the country. That's only 20,000 families because there's only 100,000 people. Every family in the country with what's called a hash hut by some or an ant box by others, a 40 foot container jammed full of Bitcoin miners, A6, S19, uh, J Pro Bitcoin miners. So this 40 foot container will produce about 4,000 USD a day in Bitcoin, okay? So a family that's on 150 bucks a week oh. will now have a 40 foot container producing 4K USD a day for them. 28k USD a week or about 50k Australian a week for a family that's used to getting paid 150 Tongan dollars a week. So that effectively turns Tonga into a little Dubai. Instead of every family having an oil uh, wow. they'll have one of these. So because the Bitcoin community is funny like that, um, the tech for this and for this has been offered to me gratis. The tech, the maintenance, installation, uh, Bitcoiners, especially big time Bitcoiners, for some reason, like seeing the little engine that could uh, yeah. succeed. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's a, you guys will know what our community is like. Right. So, yeah. So then, that's gratis. <laughs> And I'm realizing man, now, sorry, I'm realizing yeah, now how stupid uh, that question is. Will you miss the IMF and World Bank? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So when we got, uh, in 2014, Tonga got fiber to the door um, from the World Bank. So it's the last project we did with the World Bank at that level. And uh, my mother was the... Minister of Communications at the time. So she was the one who negotiated with the World Bank. And because she's cheap and wouldn't pay for their own lawyer, uh, she got her son <laughs> free to do their, new, their negotiations. And uh, what I told, advised her to do was um, the World Bank kept coming back with, we can't give you the loan because after measuring your economic growth, there's no way you can service the debt. So I kept telling her uh, the the World Bank rep was also a, a woman. Uh, I said, I kept telling her, tell the lady, can she tell you explicitly why we can't get the loan? So she's very diplomatic. She said, oh, the economic growth, just, makes it seem that it's not going to be viable. So the words like via, not viable, um, uh, not secure. And my mother just kept, I kept telling her, my mother went, that's enough. I mean, she's already said so. I said, no, no, just keep going, trust me. So eventually the lady said, Tonga's too poor to afford the loan. So as soon as she said that, um, I told my mother, excuse uh, ourselves for 10 minutes and we'll go outside and come back in. So we went out and I told her, go back in and remind her that according to their own charter, the World Bank Charter, they have a category called an LDN, Least Developed Nation Status. If you're an LDN, then the World Bank, by their own charter, has to give you the money. If you've begun negotiations on a project, and it ends up that you're an LDN, they have to give it to you as a grant. It's not a loan. So we went back in and my mother mentioned it to her and then you could see the lady's eyes, she clicked and then she saw what we'd been doing the whole time was when she mentioned we were too poor, we then qualified mm -hmm. as an LDN. So we ended up getting the money as a grant. So well because it was the grant, I told my mother, you know, we're not gonna get a deal like this ever again. 
So you should future-proof the network as much as possible. So what that meant was we got bandwidth enough for a million people, but there's only 100,000 of us. So I told her, get enough bandwidth so we won't have to upgrade for another 100 years. So we got enough bandwidth for a million people. We have about two or 3,000 gigabit up and down to the door. The whole country uses five gigabit. <laughs> um, so um, what we're going to do is I went into a deal with Cisco. Uh, we're going to make half of the container Bitcoin mining rigs and the other half data centers. So... Uh, AWS's Southern Hemisphere headquarters are in Sydney and they have their server farms in New South Wales and Victoria. So 0.01% of AWS's Southern Hemisphere business, which is headquartered out of Sydney, is worth $200 billion a year. Okay? So if we get 0.01% of their business, that's $200 billion a year for time. So with a GDP of 500 Sorry, million. 200 billion. 200 billion. Wow. Per annum. So that's, if so that's 800 that, current GDP. Wow. Yeah. So no, not eight times. Remember, wow. we're 500 million. 80. So that's, wow. yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's 400 times. times. So Tonga will <laughs> get four, 400 years worth of economic activity. We get paid for four centuries of Holy. our economic activity in 12 months. Okay, so th this sounds absolutely amazing. Don't worry, I'm, I'm, I'm completely on board. And, and far as I know, Bitcoin is whatnot. But to play devil's advocate a yeah. little bit, um, yep. a country like Tonga, you know, what was it, 400 times, increasing your GDP 400 times, are you going to see American or Chinese aircraft carriers parked off the doorstep? Like, what's the opposition to this? Surely they're not going to let this sort of play out. Um, the US yeah, has not been um, upfront in the Pacific uh, with mm. protecting us from China. So it's going to be geopolitically almost impossible for them to come in and suddenly say, all right, we're going to stop you from prospering in case China has something to do with it. So if you've left us to fend for ourselves for the past 50 years, then there's no justification for you to come in and suddenly say, uh, yeah, you can't do that because we've looked after you, so you've got to be loyal to us because they haven't looked after us. The, the five eyes have been completely negligent for the past 50 years. That's why, and you can go into Chatham House, uh, you go into Wharton School, you go into any think tank in London or Washington, D.C., and they will tell you, uh, I can show you the studies. Their own studies say every year they warn the five eyes, stop being so negligent. China's getting in more, stop being so negligent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So China's not going to mind because it just means that there's more um, there's more uh, kitty out there for them to take control of. If Tonga's extremely prosperous, mm -hmm. then paying back all those loans in digital yuan uh, becomes a viable proposition. So the more Tonga uh, partners with them, the more their influence grows. So, yeah, it's going to be more geopolitically about each one deciding how much they are going to press the issue and step on the other's toes for fear of retaliation by the other side, not necessarily us. So we're not the issue. Mm -hmm. They are the issue to one another. That's absolutely incredible. I mean, just looking at those machines and those who are listening, uh, you need to jump onto the YouTube and have a look. I mean, going uh, from what, 500 million to potentially 200 yeah, billion 200 in GDP billion. is so, incredible. Yeah. So that's literally 400 years worth of our GDP in 12 months.
Um, how's the like? How's the internet going to work? I mean, you, infrastructure in terms of yeah, Tonga, so you said they, is pretty good, but to the main they internet. really roll that out. So my estate, there's parts of my estate that there's no running water, no electricity. The government has not installed running water and electricity yet, but there's five G. <laughs> so when you're an emerging market, you, your beggars can't be choosers. So if the aid you're getting is internet, you take the internet. Mm. If your schools and roads haven't been upgraded yet, then too bad. You take what you can get when it's given. So we have to wait for the aid to come to upgrade our schools and roads, but at least we've got 5G internet. So the country is 99% uh, uh, internet penetration, 95% smartphone penetration. So um, I'm not sure if you've heard of Digicel. Uh, it's an Irish company that operates mostly okay. out of the Caribbean, uh, Africa, and the Pacific. It's a telco. So they completely, uh, it's the one that Telstra's trying to buy. Um, uh, the Australian government is pushing Telstra to buy because Digicel put themselves on the market for $2 billion and Huawei is about to buy them. And Scott Morrison went, we can't have a Chinese company own all the mobile networks in the Pacific because Digicel came in and beat out our local government telco in Tonga, in Samoa, in Fiji. So they ended up getting more profit from being the rails for digital fiat remittances. So what they do is they give out free phones to everyone so that your relatives in Sydney and Los Angeles can send you remittances to your handset. So they go online to the Digicel website and they send uh, remittances to your, uh, your Digicel, call, it's called mobile money, and they replace Western Union because now the person doesn't have to go into Western Union uh, Digicel still still takes the 30%, but um, you get it to your phone. So mm -hmm. the upshot of that was, ironically, Digicel has put in all the infrastructure that we'll use for Bitcoin. They gave out all the free smartphones and they installed all the point of sale uh, cash registers that can take uh, phone swipes uh, at all the merchant shops. So all we do is we switch, we add one app to all those cheap Chinese Android smartphones that they've given everyone uh, is Moon Wallet, Wallet of Satoshi, Strike, whatever you want. You put that on the, on the phone and then you put the um, BTC server, I mean, BTC Pay uh, server software on the point of sale iPad. And there you've got your commercial solution. So if, if my calculations are correct, uh, I'm here in Australia, by the way, you yep. have 100 times faster internet than I do. And I pay about $80 a month for it. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Hmm. So I can have my Xbox One, my PlayStation 5, uh, my Netflix, my HBO Max, my Hulu, um, all going at once. And all at 4K. Wow. So what's the yeah, digital Tonga's nomad scene? Tomorrow. Yeah, what, what's it like in Tonga, <laughs> digital nomad scene? Because I'd love to visit. Um, it's pretty quiet because this is not widely known yet. Um, I don't think even our, uh, just the bandwidth issue, which makes it extremely attractive for digital nomads. If they knew that you can run... Um, you can log into your uh, company's VPN and have a stable connection 24 hours a day. So you're effectively working as part of your company's intranet while you're in Tonga. Um, that's how much bandwidth there is, stable bandwidth. So, yeah, citizenship, there's an investment pathway, which is a lot because it was built around Chinese, rich uh, Hong Kongese um, uh, in 
the 97, around 97, when Hong Kong went back to China, a lot of merchants fled Hong Kong with their money and came to the Pacific. So Tonga has a 5 million fiat uh, investment path, uh, which is misleading because it's not necessarily investment. You just have to have a bank account in Tonga in your name or your company's name and deposit 5 million Tongan into it. So you're not investing in anything. You can just put money into your account. Um, but because of fractional reserve banking, which is how uh, fiat, no, well, fiat central banking, as we know, the problem is with fiat is one central banking, um, the value purchase price is controlled centrally. The second is that the distribution of fiat is done by fractional reserve banking by commercial banks. So your 5 million gets to Tonga, so the Tongan bank can then loan out 90% of it and only keep 10% for you, just the same way fractional reserve banking works everywhere. So that's the reason for the 5 mil path. The other path is naturalization, either by marriage or living there for five years. What percentage of Tongan adult population is unbanked? Uh, between about 65 and 70 is the last World Bank figures. Okay. Are there um, microfinance programs available for them? Um, yeah, they've, they come and go. Uh, so we have what's called a National Development Bank which mm -hmm. was built um, by His Late Majesty Dubai the Fourth when he modernised Tonga to provide loans to farmers. So they're agricultural loans. Um, they, they're not given out commercially to commercial clients. Uh, so de facto, it's microfinancing, but it's from a, a national development bank. Um, and then there are local programs that have um, come and gone in various villages. There'll be a person there um, who's got connections to someone who's done microfinancing before uh, in Africa or in the Caribbean, and they come and help mm -hmm. them out, get that program going, and then it'll die off after a year or two. So nothing permanent. Because that was something that popped in my head when you're mentioning that people will be saving X amount because they're receiving Bitcoins is... That's not just a saving, that is a potential opportunity that they can exactly. use it as capital. That's right. So That's is right. that on the framework as a potential Bitcoin microfinance? Um, yeah, 100%. Everything that comes with Bitcoin, microfinancing, Bitcoin bonds like Naive's done. Uh, so that four step is, is the skeleton. That's the, the core structure. And then all the ancillary uh, benefits uh, will be um, uh, pursued on a case-by-case -case basis. If there's one and there's private sector interest in it and we've got people who've come up with the money for it and we can get it going, then we'll do that particular one. So um, there won't be a, a sort of buckshot attempt to do everything on, this, on the spectrum. Uh, yeah, things that come up one by one uh, as being viable, uh, will be pursued to the extent of its viability. All right, so there's a lot going on here. Me and Gordon are gobsmacked, actually, or by just what, what you're doing. Um, how can our listeners get involved? What can they do to help? And, and also just thinking about the relief that um, is required recently. But for people listening, what is the key message you want to get yep. out, to, out to them? Uh, yeah. Well, from your end, I would uh, advocate with your local uh, representatives, your state representatives. The more that Bitcoin gets recognized internationally, the more viable it is for small emerging markets countries to do so. So encourage your own political representatives uh, to support it uh, at, a, at a macro level, that would be uh, great for Tonga. Uh, and encourage them to be supportive of emerging markets like Tonga 
who are looking to, I don't like this phrase, but uh, to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps who are trying uh, to use Bitcoin to, yeah, generate wealth for themselves and move themselves away from being dependent on those metropolitan countries' uh, development aid. So, yeah, support for that at a macro level. And then at a micro level, we've got uh, the Liquidity for Tonga project, which uh, is on Telegram. I'll send you guys the link for it. And that's a program that wasn't even established by me. Um, we were all members of uh, a liquidity program for El Salvador, which is uh, node owners. So I run a number of Bitcoin nodes. Uh, so node owners around the world who connect to each other in liquidity rings and then connect to El Salvador to provide El Salvador with liquidity rings that their diaspora can access to send remittances through frictionlessly and cheaply to El Salvador. So without my knowing, two gentlemen from our group began liquidity for Tonga and began recruiting people to build liquidity rings for the same purpose for Tonga. So they ended up telling me and I ended up joining up. So we have a telegram group and everyone there has nodes which we have in various rings of liquidity, which we uh, daisy chain together. I'm not sure how much you guys are into Lightning uh, and how it works. Uh, oh, we've covered we, Lightning in the show. Yeah. Yep. So yeah. we uh, so because it's a Bitcoin full Bitcoin node, it is also then a Lightning node. So we get Lightning liquidity rings that are then. Uh, channeled to Tonga so that Tonga is the end point. So you can be, uh, and curiously enough, they did their research. So they looked for members in cities where there are high concentrations of Tonga diaspora. So Auckland, Sydney, San Francisco, Los Angeles. And if you're diaspora there, then you just connect to one of the nodes and you can send frictionless uh, remittances back through time and it'll go through our lightning uh, liquidity rings. Uh, and then finally, there's a fund. Uh, this is only since um, the volcano and the tsunami. So this is very ironic. Uh, when the volcano and the tsunami hit, um, our, our comms, both voice and data, were completely wiped out, legacy comms, because our undersea cable, which brings fibre to the door, was severed in two places. Our satellite backup collapsed. So no voice or comms could get in or out. But while I've been in hospital, um, do you guys know Samson Mo? Blockstream, mm -hmm. yeah. Blockstream. So Samson sent me a couple of Blockstream base units to hospital as get well gifts, uh, which I sent back to Tonga. <laughs> so awesome. ironically, the only thing that got into Tonga for the fortnight when comms were down were big, all the Bitcoin donations that we airdropped from the Bitcoin from the Blockstream satellite to my base units in Tonga. Oh, wow. So, yeah, when everything else failed, <laughs> only Bitcoin still worked. Isn't, so, that, and that's because, isn't it funny? Like, pe people talk about, you know, know, if the internet goes down and whatever, yeah, Bitcoin's gonna not happen? gonna work. I mean, that's absurd <laughs> anyway. You got more problems, but yeah. actually, no, that's not even true. It can yeah, still actually Bitcoin work. When Bitcoin went down, it was the only thing that worked. <laughs> and that's precisely because the block sizes are kept at a level mm. which you can transmit over radio waves. So unfortunately there was no voice, so I couldn't call them to instruct them. Mm. What we could have done was form a mesh network, which was just yeah. connect everyone's Wi-Fi routers to one another, all the cell phone towers mm. and radio wave towers to one another and have an internal national intranet and you can just transact in Bitcoin across the whole country without any internet access whatsoever. 
and then just sync it on chain afterwards when the internet comes back on. Mm. Or even so, the satellite. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was crazy. And I, yeah, Samson, we were very thankful to Samson. So that liquidity came from donations to uh, the Bitcoin fund. There's still, I'll find the link somewhere for the Bitcoin mm. donation page. Um, yeah, so that's how people can help. And that's awesome. That's I mean, you you personally have an amazing story, but also, you know, we talk about Bitcoin solving everything, which it doesn't. But in Tonga and 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 perhaps some of your neighboring uh, countries as well, it kind of does solve a lot of problems. So, oh, it does. You know, so if there weren't if it weren't for Bitcoin mining, there'd be no reason for the volcano Bitcoin mining, and therefore there'd be no reason for us to get this electricity generation infrastructure for free. So that electricity generation, remember I said 2000 megawatts, 40 for the national grid, 400 for this stuff. That still leaves 1,560 megawatts with nothing to do. So what do you do? We can now do what Canada does to New York and New Jersey. We can export electricity to Samoa, Fiji, to Valu for cost that's below any of their costs because most of the Pacific, 90%, we use the most expensive form of power, which is the 1970s diesel generators that we got um, when uh, the Five Eyes still did uh, infrastructure aid. Mm. So, yeah, most of the Pacific uses diesel generators, which is the dirtiest and most expensive way to get power. So we can give them clean power much more cheaply than they're getting now and mm. still at a rate which will profit Tonga billions. Mm. But I thought Bitcoin mining was causing climate change. <laughs> I know, right? So ironically, <laughs> my daytime job is as the chairman of GOPAC for Oceania, uh, anti the uh, global... Uh, organization of parliamentarians against corruption. So we do that with the UNODC and with NATO uh, and with Interpol. We trace um, illicit, it actually has a lot to do with crypto and Bitcoin. We trace illicit financial flows to the Middle East and to ISIS and with the triads out of China um, and from the cartels in South America. Uh, and then my other daytime job is the chairman of the Commonwealth's uh, Pacific Parliamentary Group, uh, which does um, human rights, uh, gender equality, and climate change. So we have to uh, go around member nations and assess how closely they're keeping to their promises of 1.5 degrees in the Paris Agreement. And Bitcoin is the greenest industrial sector on the planet. <laughs> so the American national grid, 12% renewable, North American Bitcoin mining, 65% renewable. And Tongas will be 100% geothermal. Exactly, 100% renewable. So, yeah, but Bitcoin's boiling the oceans, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> so from people who are worst hit, um, part of my GOPAC job is to go in to countries and um, set up their anti-corruption commissions for them. So I went into Kiribati and set up the anti-corruption commission, set up the anti-corruption committee in their parliament. But... Uh, some days we'd have to hop on the desk in the hotel room because at high tide the seawater comes in about a foot high in your room because their country's sinking. Oh, so climate change in the Pacific, we are the worst hit. But So we know the science and the science mm. is Bitcoin yeah. mining is the same as Christmas lights mm. or theory. Siri and Alexa use more electricity than yeah. Bitcoin. It's like 0.2% or something ridiculous. Yeah, exactly. It's less than 15 basis points. 
Um, when the critics don't know what to criticize Bitcoin for, that's just the laziest argument they go to is electricity. Well, there's that. And of course, who loses the most from Bitcoin? Legacy finance. Yeah. Who owns legacy media? Legacy finance. Yeah, exactly. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, like, and share so we can find others like yourself. Call the consultation. I had to um, take a package of legislation that was introduced by not the former government in Tonga, the one before that, which sought to amend the constitution and effectively turn us into a banana republic. So they wanted to take um, the authority of the judiciary and the legislature and put it all under cabinet. Uh, so we're a, we've been a full democracy for 12 years now. So 2010, uh, our monarch whose family has ruled us peacefully for 1,412 years, um, just decided in 2010, yeah, I think, uh, it might be a good idea to be a full democracy. So he's the first monarch since, yeah, no, Charles the first had, um, what's his name? Um, at his chomping at his heels. Uh, yeah, no, on? since the Roman Empire. He's the first oh, yes. full monarch since the Roman Empire to voluntarily uh, cede all executive power. Wow. So right. being a young democracy, there have been uh, growing pains. And then a government, uh, two governments ago, decided um, we'll give it a crack, see if we can only run the whole thing <laughs> and put the judiciary and, and the legislature under themselves in cabinet and then effectively have the PM run the whole country like a president, uh, wow. but without separation of powers. Yeah. So I argued that was uh, uh, it was uh, contrary to the Constitution, number one, but even if it weren't, to amend the Constitution at that fundamental level triggers our provision in our parliamentary house rules that requires a two-week public consultation uh, of all legislation. So we don't have... Uh, what do you want to call it? Um, referendum legislation. So this is the closest thing to a referendum. So I had to travel around every single village in the country doing four hours in the morning, four hours at night, and pretty much explain the legislation to every single person in the country. <laughs> so it was really hectic. It went for two months. I got back, uh, I collapsed, and I didn't realise that I'd already been ill throughout. So I collapsed and I died uh, in time. Mm -hmm. So they revived me um, and then kept me alive for 36 hours while they scoured the Pacific for an uh, air ambulance. Um, our closest always, obviously, is Auckland. Uh, Auckland uh, didn't have one spare. Next is Sydney. Sydney didn't have one spare. So they... Uh, gave Brisbane a crack and fortunately there was one there. So uh, uh, an air ambulance flew in from Brisbane, medevac me to here. And uh, because I'd already died, <coughs> it was, <coughs> excuse me, a touch and go as you can expect. Mm -hmm. So the, the OR staff were literally on the tarmac uh, and began operating en route to Middlemore and then at Middlemore and then over the next three days, I died another two times and they revived me again. So, yeah, it took me three deaths um, to finally uh, realise that Bitcoin is the most pristine asset on the planet. And yeah. <laughs> I, I think that's the most best post-death story ever. Path, most people get an easier path. To our, to our <laughs> entrepreneur. I had to die three times to, um, yeah. So I'd been, as you would have heard from me and, and Pedro's interview, I'd been exposed to it in 2013, mm. uh, had it ripped away from me. And then again in 2016, uh, had it ripped away from me. And then 
in 2019, I was on my back for the better half of half a year, couldn't move, couldn't speak, couldn't swallow even. I wasn't mm. allowed a sip of water for half a year. So they just rub ice cubes wow. on your lungs because wow. the throat had collapsed when they slid it open to put the air pipe in. So if I swallowed, it goes straight into the lungs. So they didn't close my throat up until after about five or six months. So it got fed through a tube that went through the nose and then down the esophagus straight into the stomach. And yeah, so there's nothing else much to do for those six months. I couldn't even hold a phone in two hands. So I could at least play Scrabble or something. Or I could only hold in one hand and swipe with a thumb. So as you would have heard on that podcast, mm -hmm. I yeah, went rabbit holing to the max. So I pretty much read every word that's ever been printed about Bitcoin, every uttered audio word that's ever been recorded, or video that's been broadcast, and um, came to the realisation, as everyone who gets orange pill does, that uh, Bitcoin's the most pristine asset on the planet. It's sound money, uh, which we haven't had since the Florin. Um, it provides barrierless entry to capital markets that people that look like me previously did not have access to. Mm. Um, and, that, and that's for an OECD country. Mm. Uh, for an emerging market, uh, that's not a long time preference. It can change our world now. It can reclaim our GDP by providing us remittance rails that are instant peer-to-peer -peer international, no intermediaries instantly and for free rather than the 30% that the remittance industry uh, value uh, price gauges, gouges and value scrapes from the poorest of our population. So, yeah, this, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Lord. Yeah, this is something I've been taking notes on listening to your, your other podcasts. And um, yeah, I've got a lot of questions. So I'm just trying to figure out which to go first with. Yeah. Um, yeah no but worries. for people who are hearing you for the first time, um, Tonga's GDP is around 500, 550 million a year. 40% mm -hmm. of that is remittances, which is um, your diaspora overseas sending money back home. That's fascinating right. to me hearing you say you have people who have never been to Tonga and are third generation sending money back home. You're um, sending money back home. Yeah, and that's something I want to talk to you about later as well, just that intergenerational um, family and legacy that, that yeah. we... Because uh, I grew up in the Middle so East. You can, you can measure so. the strength of our culture by mm. actual tangible economic metrics because yes. stronger because it's so strong, it triggers remittances being sent back by people who have never even seen uh, their homeland. So, so that's, that's something, yeah, that's something I, want, I was surprised by when you say, okay, I understand the short-term solution to Bitcoin because when you are paying, and I back in the envelope here, about 38 million a year, you're giving up in remittances, that 30% so, that would go somewhere like Western Union. <clears throat> uh, well, about 14. So we're getting, um, about 60 million a year okay. in, uh, sorry, 40%, 200. Yeah, 60 million in fees. Oh, wow, that you're, that you're losing, 60 million. So fees. of the 510, yeah. 200 are remittances, 200 million. Yep. And then 19% and of that is remittances. Fees. Yeah. Wow. So Western yeah. Union or? Who I was getting that. Yeah, so, yeah, about so that's just the union and you know. the banks. The banks less so yeah. for two reasons. Yeah. Number one, 70% or 65, between 65 and 67% of the country's unbanked anyway. Uh, and the banks charge a lower price. The banks, the banks mm -hmm. are about 5 to 10%. Um, the remittance industry is around 30%. Even if on their website it says 10%, it says 10%, then there's a little asterisk. And the asterisk says at the bottom, Western Union also 
makes profits from being a currency mm. exchange uh, business. So they charge the you spread. for the spread. So the spread adds up mm. to 30%. So, so if Tonga's wow. overseas, we're sending money back home using Bitcoin instead of Western mm. Union or PayPal or whatever, you'd instantly have a 30 or 40% more Instant. money. Instantly. So it, it means... So one of them has to eat the cost. If you send 100, mm. they get 70. So that means Tonga eats the cost. Mm. If you want them to get 100, you have to send 130 so the diaspora eats the cost. Usually they just send the 100 so Tonga eats the cost. So it'll be the GDP in Tonga that is reclaimed. For a portion, it'll be the diaspora that's reclaiming the 30, but for the majority, it'll be uh, Tonga. So Tonga reclaims that 30%. Uh, percent. So that means every person in the country, because effectively everyone receives remittances, even the royal family mm -hmm. receives remittances. So everyone in the country gets 30% extra disposable income. Yeah. So that's if you're an American, mm -hmm. that's like having federal income tax removed completely. So and, I know, uh, you know, yeah. uh, us in Western countries, you know, Bitcoin and people trade and whatnot, but it seems like, and I know, you know, um, I, I'm not sure what the political correct term is nowadays, emerging market, it's not developing yeah. country, but uh, it seems like Tonga's rife with Bitcoin. So you've got, you know, volcanoes, geothermal stuff, you've got, you know, remittances, exactly. payments, all that kind of stuff. It, it's just, um, yeah, the stars of a line for Tonga, for, mm. for what reason, I don't know. It just happens to be the intersection of all... Um, the optimal uh, sort of elements that you'd want for Bitcoinizing an emerging market nation. Uh, so instead of being um, a consumer investment choice for an OECD uh, metropolitan citizen, where it's a store of value and it'll appreciate to bring you wealth and eventually work towards a medium of exchange and then finally, somewhere down the line, unit of account. In emerging mm -hmm. markets, back to front. So medium of exchange first, like in El Salvador. Mm -hmm. And remittance rail. So same, that's a medium of exchange for us. And then once we receive it and being afforded the extra value that Bitcoin gives you, then people who have never afforded to have savings, not just themselves, mm -hmm. their entire lineage for generations back. No one's ever afforded to have savings because it's always hand to mouth. So you're the first person in a thousand years of your family's lineage who can afford savings. So then you move to store of value. So we begin medium exchange store of value, OECD store of value medium exchange. So it shows you how pristine the asset is back to front still works perfectly. So, um, it's not a consumer investment choice for emerging markets. It's a lifesaver. It's a salvation. Uh, it's like a buoy in an ocean of uh, water where there's no land in sight. It's like a lifeboat. If you're in Venezuela or Nigeria and your pay packet mm. devalues between the time you pick it up at work and the mm. time you get to the shop, the currency is devalued in those two hours. Uh, you put it in Bitcoin and it holds the value. So you don't, you, it doesn't get melted away. And if you're remitting value like we are, uh, it reclaims the value that the remittance industry just scrapes. So, yeah, it's a survival choice for us. So, so just on that, how do, sorry, how do, when you're evangelizing Bitcoin, um, mm -hmm. how do you relate the, price the short term, and I say short term, 18 month, price volatility to Bitcoin, where it can drop 50 to 80% right. in a few weeks. How does that affect your mission? How does it affect the adoption rate for Bitcoin when people are using it in the short term as remittance? Um, so do you mean after legal tender? No, so it, you're, so from my understanding, um, you're trying to get Bitcoin so your Bitcoin journey is to get it as remittance. So rather than people using Western Union or banks, get yeah. them to use Bitcoin. Yeah, um, in, the, in the immediate term. So in the immediate yeah, term. Yeah, in the immediate term. That's a commercial. Uh, yeah. um, 
a commercial solution which mm -hmm. doesn't require any government intervention. All it requires is remitters to take. Um, yes. Yeah, I see your point. I'm just I'm giving you mm -hmm. the con context. So all it requires is remitters to choose Bitcoin rather than fiat. And mm -hmm. ultimately, and most importantly, is for merchants to accept it. Yeah. Yep. In exchange for goods and services. So the retail sector in Tonga, there are no ethnic Tongans that own retail in Tonga anymore. It is in That's the like Chinese, the 5% Chinese. Chinese. Yeah. Yeah. So our population is 5% Chinese. And they completely decimated the Tongan retail sector in the late 90s, early 2000s. Mm. Um, mm. Much to the chagrin of Tongan businessmen, but uh, much to the uh, pleasure of Tongan consumers because the Tongan consumers got cheaper goods, mm. their shops, because by law, um, Tonga's a, a devout Christian country. Uh, our constitution is the only one on the planet that forbids trading on Sunday by law. Uh, you're not allowed to make noise on Sunday. Um, if you're having a loud party, the police will come and tell you to turn the music down. Um, so, Switzerland. Yeah. So Tongan stores don't open on Sunday. Chinese stores, someone will be in the store and it'll be shut, but you can go around the back and they'll, they'll give you... <laughs> Chinese are open 24 seven, seven days a week. Rain or shine, Chinese shops never close. So for the consumers, it's great, but it decimated our, our retail sector. So what's the upshot of that? The upshot of that is Chinese merchants take any currency and mm. they know more about Bitcoin than Tongan locals. Mm. So what they do for all currencies is face value. So if you turn up, you, you just got off, you're a Tongan diaspora. You just got off the plane from LA. You're on your way back from the airport. You stop off at a drugstore. You want to buy a can of Coke. You go in. I've only got USD. The Chinese merchant goes, yeah, no worries, but only face value. I'm not a currency exchange. So dollar for dollar. Your American dollar, you give it to me, uh, and that's worth one Tongan dollar. So the merchant, of course, because one US dollar, it takes three Tongan dollars to equal one US dollar. So he's making a profit. So they do the same for the Bitcoin. They go, yeah, this is how much Bitcoin equals one Tongan dollar. The Tongan remittance recipient has no idea what the, the day's rate is. And it's too complicated to calculate anyway. So they'll go, yeah, here you go. Mm. They'll pay for um, their can of Coke with the remittance they got from their cousin. Um, so, strictly speaking, the central bank could come in and say, you're acting, as soon as you give them fiat for Bitcoin, you're acting as an exchange. You're acting as, as a currency broker. And for that, you need a financial operator's license, and you don't have that, so we can close you down. So, strictly mm -hmm. speaking, they could do that. No one has because, um, yeah, they just couldn't, can't be bothered. Strictly speaking, they could mm -hmm. until it's legal tender. But then also, strictly speaking, the Chinese merchants, and they know this, could say um, at international law under all the UN uh, financial conventions, once a country, whatever is the... Um, the, the currency of a sovereign nation, uh, even though the New Zealand dollar is worth about 40 cents, everywhere in the world has to accept the New Zealand dollar as foreign currency because it is the sovereign, it is the currency of a sovereign nation. So on the 7th of September 2021, every nation on the planet, strictly speaking at international law, had to accept Bitcoin as foreign currency the day uh, El Salvador Absolutely. made legal tender. So that's the counter argument. So with that, um, and with El Salvador, that obviously creates some ripples with the IMF and World Bank in that they basically threatened that they'd remove them from the, the aid circuit. 
Is this a consideration in Tonga where almost 20% of your GDP is foreign aid? And did you actually have to make that trade off? Like if we accept Bitcoin here, we yeah. may be black sheep cut off from foreign aid. Yeah. So our current king, um, he was our prime minister in the early 2000s. So in the early 2000s, we got a loan from the IMF and the World Bank. And the conditions of the loans were the austerity measures that were popular in the early 2000s. So austerity measures means cut public spending for social services. Um, if you're an African nation, cut any spending on your tertiary mining industry. I mean, on your tertiary industries like manufacturing and telecommunications, you're not allowed to spend the loan on that because you might develop into a, uh, a developed nation yourself, but we want you to remain as a mine. So you're only allowed to spend that money on extractive industries uh, like mining. If you're a Tonga, so you're a plantation and an aquarium. So you can spend that money on fisheries and agriculture, but not on telecommunications. And you have to cut public service wages by 40 percent so which you guys that, have rights about yeah so for in the 1400 his, year history of our country that caused the only rights we have ever had um and the king when he was prime minister is still incorrectly blamed directly for that that it was his government's fault that these rights occurred but they were just implementing the World Bank IMF uh, conditions. If we didn't implement it, we wouldn't get the loan. So the king, rightly, in my opinion, uh, I can't speak for him, but I'm assuming would not be too unhappy seeing the back of an institution that has put a black mark on his name forever. Mm. Or... And um, yeah, he wouldn't be. I mean, it's exactly like Naib's answer to, to Pedro in their interview when Peter McCormack interviewed Naib Bukele. Um, Peter went, well, what about if these people get angry? And Naib said, well, these people haven't really been so nice to us <laughs> in the past. So why should we be worried about what they think? Exactly. They've never been good to us. Yeah. And you still owe, oh, well, not you personally, but you still owe debt to the World Bank or? Um, yeah, marginally, most of it's okay. gone because, excuse me, we moved more to the ADB oh. and it was a combination, ADB and China, because the only reason we loan off them is for infrastructure. And the Five Eyes stopped doing infrastructure in the 70s, um, much to their loss. Um, and if you want a, a school or a hospital or roads done, China will give it to you practically for free, uh, either for a soft loan or as a grant. So that's where 67% of our foreign debt is China's Chinese owned. And you um, had a recent yeah. visit by the foreign minister. That's right. Yeah. So Samoa has gone the full hog. If you go to Samoa's main waterfront road, you can look end to end and there is no building that is not Chinese built. All the government buildings are Chinese built. We've, we've, we're about halfway. Solomon Island's about two thirds. Samoa is full of, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, this is the next leg that Bitcoin is. It's not just an online peer-to-peer -peer currency. It is now part of macro geopolitical discourse Absolutely. and it's going to be a key player. Yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. So mm -hmm. Bitcoin, I mean, geopolitics is not a zero sum game. So China banning Bitcoin mining by private citizens mm -hmm. and then mining Bitcoin itself quietly by the government. Those are not mutually exclusive events. Mm -hmm. Those events can be occurring simultaneously. And I can almost guarantee you that they are. Um, so yeah, because China, China's not afraid of the USD. 
in China's, um, the Chinese don't plan in terms of uh, four-year election cycles <laughs> or even generations. The Chinese plan in terms of centuries. Yeah. So I have sat in the Chinese Communist Party headquarters in Beijing as uh, a state invited member of parliament. And I had their minister of foreign affairs tell me the 19th century was the British empire. 20th century was the American mm. empire. 21st century is ours. We are claiming it. And mm. in their um, foray to make the digital yuan the world reserve currency, they think nothing of the US dollar. It's a dead currency. Mm. Bitcoin, they're concerned about. Oh. Because that can't be controlled by any government. Yeah. So that falls beyond the remit of them showering Ghana with mm. money so that you have entire townships in Ghana that have no English signs at the stores. They're all in Mandarin because it's a mining town. And China, China has set up rails to replace the... IMF World Bank rails. The rails that the IMF and the World Bank mm -hmm. lay to the mines in Africa, to agriculture in the South America, to fisheries and agriculture in the Pacific, to feed the metropole countries, uh, the EU mm -hmm. and France with the CFA countries, um, the old British Empire through the Commonwealth, uh, the US through everywhere. Um, China's just gone in and doubled up on all those rails in every one of those places uh, to replace the IMF and the World Bank rails and gone, they're going to make you do austerity measures. Come with us. It's free. Um, their um, foreign policy, their foreign policy discourse is very subtle. They ask nothing in return at face value. Mm -hmm. So everything is no strings attached. But obviously, there are the very uh, intrinsic strings attached. So mm. when they build you a hospital, there'll be uh, a play act at tendering it out, but it will always go to CCECC, uh, mm. the Chinese-owned government uh, construction oh. company. And all the architects, right down to the guy that pushes the wheelbarrow from the cement mixer to the hole, he's imported from China. Even that low level of labor, they don't use local labor. So everything is brought over from China. So all the money goes back to China. Uh, you get a free hospital. I mean, you can't complain about that, mm -hmm. but the money goes back to China. The we had our first, yeah. yeah, we had our first human trafficking case in 2016 because they go to the extent of flying out human traffic females to service the construction workers in brothels inside the construction compound. And one of these girls caught loose from the construction compound and ran to the nearest house in the village, knocked on the door, they took it to the cops and this time discovered its first human trafficking case. So that's the extent to which they are a, a, a closed garden. <laughs> their, their ecosystem is, uh, they come right in, you'll get the hospital, but all that capital is going back to China. It's not going to employ anybody. It's not going to spend money in your economy because all the goods are brought from China. Um, even the food, their food is brought over from China. So, yeah. yeah. Reminds Tom me of that. Sorry, good words. Now you go. I was just to say, it reminds me of a movie. Who was the movie with, um, uh, you know, when the mafia is basically handing out, you know, free food to the neighborhood and like everyone's excited and, and whatnot. Yeah. That, uh, it sort of reminds me of that. But um, all right. we, yeah, we, we all know the use cases of Bitcoin, but um, yeah. wh wh where's the reality versus the theory? Like, for example, when are you going to be able to pay with digital yuan versus Bitcoin lightning in Tonga? Uh, digital yuan, I mean, that's entirely up to Chinese foreign policy. What they'll do is what the US did uh, with Saudi Arabia with the petrodollar. Mm. There'll come a time where, as the Saudis and 
the Arabs did in the 70s. They went, you want to buy petrol, you've got to pay for it in USD. We're not going to accept any other currency for petrol. So China will eventually go because every country, including the US, their largest creditor is China. And when China eventually goes, okay, all the debt has to be paid in digital yuan. We're not going to take anything else. Um, that's when the digital yuan edges close to becoming uh, world reserve currency. <coughs> Excuse me. So Tonga, we've been using um, layer one to send remittances for a while now anyway, because it's cheaper than Western Union, even with the layer one fees, um, base layer fees, base layer speed, still faster than Western Union. Um, so come lightning, uh, it's a no-brainer. So bill goes up in October. Uh, can, can you talk tender. about that, if you don't mind? I think our listeners will be really fascinated with your legal tender yeah. bill. Yeah, so the legal tender bill is pretty much um, a copy of the, the bill from El Salvador. So uh, I'm good friends with Louis Rodriguez, the head of the central bank in El Salvador. So they were kind enough to give me a copy ahead of time. Um, I've done what's called a gap analysis. So you usually, when you have legislation, you send it to the AG's Attorney General's Department. They run it through the constitution and all the, the relevant legislation to make sure it doesn't contradict any of the Tong legislation. Usually takes about two or three months. Um, I was in hospital. Uh, I used to work at the AG's. I was the secretary for our law reform commission. So I did the gap analysis myself in a week, but they gave it to me last year in May. So by June, the bill was ready. So the bill has been ready since June. Um, all it needed was to be tabled. So I was stuck outside of Tonga because of COVID. Uh, Tonga closed its borders in March, 2020 uh, and had zero COVID until January, 2022. Um, when we had to open the borders for first responders to come in after the volcano, then Omicron shot to the thousands within five days. And yeah, it was a small place. So um, yeah, couldn't get in. So Parliament only sits from June till November, late October, early November. June, you have to do the budget by law. July's constituency visits by law, August, September, government legislation by law, then October, private members' bills are allowed to come up. So my bill, which is a legal tender bill, which doesn't force Bitcoin upon anyone, uh, but makes it legal tender, one, so that it's an option, and two, it does make merchants have to accept that if profit. Mm. So just like El Salvador, you mm. can't discriminate against it. So, How likely is that to succeed, the bill? Um, yeah, well, I've got, what do we got? House is 26. The Lords are nine. We vote in a block always. Or we didn't have the Prime Minister's election in, November, in January, but that was an aberration. Um, we usually vote as a nine vote block because there are nine lords in the house and 17 um, people's reps. So I've been the Lord member for the past decade. Uh, I vacated my seat at the general election in November. Uh, it was going on to the third year of me being abroad uh, with for medical treatment. Um, and yeah, in good conscience, I couldn't go another year on the taxpayer's dime while being abroad. Mm -hmm. So I vacated my seat and the Lords vote for each other in time. Uh, the people's 17s people's reps are voted for by universal suffrage, just like everywhere else. The Lords in the UK, you become a Lord member just by virtue of being a Lord uh, with us. You actually have to get elected from your uh, constituency. So in my constituency, there are only three of us. Uh, so myself and my two cousins. So they've voted me in for the past decade. One is a prince. The other is a farmer. Neither have any interest in, in politics. 
So they've always said, that's why you're the one of us that went to school and did all that law rubbish so that you could go to parliament and do our job. So I've been quite happy to do that for the past decade. But I had to ask the prince go in for me because we needed, especially because it was a general election, that meant there would be an election for a new prime minister. So the nobles needed every physical body to be in the house to vote because that's the only thing I couldn't do from abroad. I did all my committee work. I submitted all my legislative policy remotely from Auckland, but I couldn't vote because you have to physically be there. So my cousin went in, so he'll table the bill for me. Nine of us are lords, so that's a block. There's 17 people's reps. Out of the 17, there are three that are already Bitcoiners through their own private journeys. So three and nine is 12. In a house of 26, 14 is a majority. So that leaves me with 14 other MPs to get two votes from. Wow. So it seems so, very likely. Well, this is what we're hoping. The volcano and the tsunami may have put us in a difficult position because, yeah, it's completely decimated our economy. It's mm -hmm. wiped out our crops. So there will be a famine in about 30 days because there will be no harvest. Uh, so we'll be entirely dependent on imported food, but we'll have no money with which to buy it. Mm -hmm. um, the ash which is still floating in has made our rainwater acid rain so no rainwater our groundwater has been poisoned by the ash so no groundwater so all the water has to be imported as well which we cannot afford um, so if there were any delay it would be because you know, the country is simply decimated but all things being equal my cousin, I speak to him at least twice a week and our conversations always end with, remember you're putting my bill up and he's like, yeah, 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 of course. No, 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 no. Um, don't forget. Yeah, don't forget. No. Yeah. So, um, yeah, goes up in October. So that will make it legal tender, mm. but then you need all the ancillary legislation. So you need the legislation for merchants. We'll need the legislation to begin doing the mining, which means we've got to set up a state-owned enterprise to facilitate the mining with the commercial partners. There's got to be legislation to um, provide for and allow the, the drilling uh, and exploration uh, undersea and underground. So all the... Um, logistical rollout, you need legislation for every part of that. So that's not going to be a big deal. It's just a matter of getting it, uh, getting it done. Um, and then uh, the legislation for rolling out uh, the, what will hopefully be international cabling. So I'm not sure how much of my plan you guys saw on Peter's podcast. Well, so what I'm familiar with is that you have a huge infrastructure in place for telecommunications in Tonga. So how many of the islands already have 5G network um, capacity? Uh, so the whole country is 5G. Yeah, the last big chunk of money we got, ironically, from the World Bank and the, and the IMF hmm. um, were, oh, jeez. Um, guys, can you give me half an hour? There is an ambulance here to give me some treatment. Okay. Um, oh, okay. About 30 minutes. Yeah, sure. Possibly. Possibly. Okay. Um, so how long do you want to talk to them for? Oh, uh, it's an international podcast interview. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep, that's cool. How long do you think? How long, roughly? We, we can sort uh, of... Uh, so no, it'll, be a while. Easy. it'll be a while because, okay. yeah, I'll, I want to cover all your questions um, thoroughly. Okay. Thank so you, let man. me get this done and I'll hit you guys. We'll back leave this time. open. All right. Cheers. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. No worries. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, like, and share so we can find others like yourself.
No, we could go. Yeah, 100%. We, we, we could go on and on um, because you personally have a fascinating story and a fascinating life. And also we want to talk about Tong and whatnot. Um, yeah. But, but m- maybe you could just put on your um, touch of crystal ball for a second. What What's the roadmap for, let's say, the next, say, five years in, in Tonga? Uh, I think it's that. I think it's what you've seen already. So the GDP remittance dependence should be within the next 12 months. The mining uh, within the next 24 months, yeah, at the latest, because um, Parliament will close in November and uh, Tonga has what's called Priya Week in January. So, yeah, Parliament really won't open. It usually opens in January, February a little bit just to finish off last year's work and then closes until the official opening in June. So the ancillary legislation, the soonest I can get it there, would be the February sitting. So that means that getting the legislation into the House, out of the House, back to the Attorney General's, sent to the Palace, in the Palace office, before Privy Council, HM signs it into law, back to the government and gazetted and becomes law. That'll take at least till May, June. Uh, and if we're unlucky, then we won't even be able to get the, the ancillary legislation in till the June sitting. So that means the mining, so the mining will begin after the ancillary legislation. So 24 months sort of outer for the mining. Um, and then within 24 to 36 months, that's for the nation state, the national level mining, 24 months, 36 months at the most for um, local level mining. This shouldn't follow too far after because the generation of the electricity, which is the major part, comes automatically with the volcano mining. So as soon as that's done, all the power to do this is there anyway. So probably 30 to 32 months. Uh, and then we'll begin uh, as um, Michael Saylor's done for micro strategy. Uh, Tonga's current 700 million US uh, treasuries, national treasuries. Uh, if we had to put them into Bitcoin in March 2020, by February 21, they would have been worth 25 billion. So in 11 months, yeah, we would have uh, 725, yeah, more than quadrupled. Uh, we would have got effectively three decades of economic activity in 11 months. So because uh, Bitcoin com- satisfies all the elements of money mm. much more uh, superior to the 5,000 year old store of value yeah. or the traditional medium of exchange, uh, we'll then move what hopefully by then will be national treasuries in the billions into Bitcoin. Uh, which will give us uh, returns. Uh, and then uh, we will have to, I've deliberately delayed this to the last, begin uh, a taxation and regulatory laws for Bitcoin as uh, mm. both income and as property. So, mm. yeah, the final part will be what OECD nations are going through now Right. which is why uh, Biden employed 40,000 new lawyers in the last 11 months at the, um, at the IRS, which is to figure out a taxation regime for Bitcoin and a regulatory framework. So that's at about 40 months. Right. And probably find, so that's probably why they banned mining in New York because mining is essentially KYC free Bitcoin. Exactly. Exactly. So, which means um, effectively for the purposes of, this is the ATO's guide. 
So effectively for the purposes of the ATO, it's tax free uh, mm. because you're not going to do any of these things with it. Mm. And I'll make sure that when Tonga does it, um, in the US, if you want tax-free Bitcoin at uh, uh, at a large capital level for your average middle-class person, then you're looking at switching your 401k into a Roth IRA and then making it a self-directed Roth IRA and then incorporating an LLC to run that Roth IRA. And that makes any Bitcoin out tax-free. Oh. So coming in at 40K, you sell it at 100K, that 60K is tax-free in America if you do it that way, through a Roth IRA, a self-directed Roth IRA with an LLC. Mm -hmm. uh, in Australia, you get a uh, self-managed self super fund. fund. Yeah, that's what I And mean. yeah, you get the self-managed super fund. You get incorporate yourself individually. You're the only director, only shareholder. You manage that. That means on the out, it's tax-free. You're getting a 50% discount anyway if you're over 12 months. And you're not doing any of these five things anyway if you're mine. Yep. So you're laughing. So as they say, if you want money, get fiat. If you want um, scarcity, well, get gold. Mm -hmm. If you want mega gains, get stocks. If you want all three mm -hmm. at the same time, you get Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the final slide of my presentation always is, this is the view down from my residence on my estate. I live on the main island. Mm -hmm. My residence on my estate, my estate's a volcano. Uh, mm -hmm. So the view down from my residence into the volcano is that, so wow. wow is that an active volcano no dormant okay. thankfully yeah. since 1926 wow beautiful so my presentation always ends with an mm. invitation for everyone to come and join us for geothermal mining uh on my island Oh, we might take you up on that, actually. So, um, no, we've... yeah, you're welcome. I've got a standing invitation. It's well known throughout the Bitcoin community. Um, that's are... why I have the Bitcoin Island domain. That <laughs> all Bitcoiners are welcome at uh, my island, gratis, free of charge. Pull up a uh, a little cabana or villa oh, or hammock wow. anywhere on the island. That's what I call a citadel. Yeah, 100%. 100%. <laughs> That's fine. So how much longer are you in Auckland for? Um, they said, well, they reckon the physio was supposed to take about six to eight months for the joint and about eight to 10 months for the femur. Mm. But I've got uh, avascular necrosis in the knees as well now, which mm. has made rehabbing the joint and the leg uh, a bit less than optimal. So fingers crossed by the end of the year. So for are those you watching, you're, you're, not, yeah. you're not in a five-star yeah. resort. You're actually in <laughs> hospital. I'm actually in, well, it's a rehab hospital and it costs me a, yeah, a fair bit to be here. So it is it is not this five-star resort that you're seeing. That's wishful thinking. <laughs> I'm actually in hospital. It's a very comfortable rehab hospital but it is hospital oh, yeah. we so, absolutely appreciate your your time for spending with us and, and our listeners no worries at all yeah, yeah my pleasure guys um i mean um, I, I i have many questions but i think uh i think we should probably um finish up there um i'd, I'd like to get into the climate change stuff but that's probably for another time faris have you got anything to end on um, no no I'll, oh, I'll... as far as i'm concerned i'm <laughs> I blocked out this part of the day for you guys. So oh, as many no, questions you. as you want. Yeah. I think look, from me personally, Laura Fussy to it is that what, I mean, both me and Gwen come originally from aid and development background. Um, I worked for NGOs, no. I taught international yeah. relations. This is where we get really excited about Bitcoin is seeing the mm. real world case scenario. Um, I will reach out to you. I do need to get going, but I will reach out to you via email because Whatever it is you are doing, and if there's any way I can help and be on a voluntary basis, um, 
I'd like to. Um, yeah, I kind of I was in the aid and development sector, and I don't know. Long story short, I think it ended up doing more harm than good. Um, I was involved yeah. with the whole Millennium Development Goals and all that kind of stuff, and so World Bank IMF programs. I know, I know those, but uh, this is where I get excited about Bitcoin. Um, Awesome. So I will reach out to you. I'll send you my credentials. And if I could be of any That's use good. to you on your mission, please, I'd like to be. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Me Very too much. as well. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we're, 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 we've got a platform, so we have to use it as, as a podcast, yeah. but also 100%. as individuals. Well. I'll most yeah. definitely be reaching out. Um, well, oh, great. Well, yeah. Free help. You don't have to tell a tongue and play. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Um, well, how about we end on this question? Um, this is kind of a stock standard question, but I think it's a, it's a good one. What can Bitcoin sort of fix and do and, and what can't it do in, in Tonga? Um, I don't want to sound like uh, an idealist, but it can pretty much, yeah, there's not too much it can't fix. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, well, I think, yeah, Bitcoin fixes everything that is under our control. Uh, Bitcoin can't fix um, the various uh, insurgents of the various geopolitical powers uh, and the extent to which both, if you are considered two sides or all of them, if you consider them multifaceted, the extent to which that insurgents, I'm not sure if that's the right word, because that has a, a particular connotation. Um, the insertion of those uh, geopolitical powers into Tonga and our region, I'm speaking more regionally. And uh, in the past week, the instance of um, all the ministers of finance of the Pacific being asked to pretty much sign an agreement on spec, uh, a Chinese agreement that they were all given uh, and had at about a day's notice, uh, which is a great agreement actually, um, but at a day's notice to sign, um, the Samoan Prime Minister, uh, she was the matron of honor at my wedding. She's like a sister to me. Um, yeah, she very eloquently stated that they weren't uh, asked for their opinion, uh, it wasn't sought. So these decisions should be made regionally uh, rather than ad hoc. Um, the metropole nations going to each nation um, individually uh, about regional questions is something that should be phased out. And uh, I think the Pacific Island Forum and what we've built there uh, should be given um, the same uh, credence as Europe expects us to give the EU uh, and for regional issues like that, uh, with just that as an example, um, they should be con more consulted on. So yeah, basically bottom line, uh, the metropole nations should be more consultative uh, both bilaterally with each nation and most definitely multilaterally with the region as a whole. Um, uh, particularly when it comes to uh, trade um, and economic policy, uh, the seasonal uh, labour regime that they've got, for instance, um, great for Tonga, great for Fiji, of Vanuatu, we send labourers over uh, because during COVID, um, the backpackers weren't allowed to travel from the Northern Hemisphere. So both the Australian and the New Zealand uh, horticulture industry was about to get ruined because there was no one to pick those billions of dollars worth of fruit. So they reached out to the Pacific. They took all our unemployed. Uh, so when they take our unemployed, they should either have the same rights under New Zealand and Australia's labour laws mm -hmm. or the companies that take them over should have those protections explicitly in the contracts. So issues like that, which you guys will understand coming from the development background, 
uh, which we don't have control over. Um, Adam Smith International, who New Zealand pays to review their Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, took me on as a consultant to review that that regional uh, the seasonal worker program, uh, and that was primarily um, again uh, an example of the lack of uh, consultation and protection across the board uh, that the Pacific countries and our peoples are given, um, which is why a lot of us, I'm not sure how much you guys know or are into what, what PESA Plus is about. Uh, so PESA Plus is our NAFTA. It basically opens up all the Pacific markets to Australia and New Zealand and yeah, it doesn't give us too much in return. Uh, so yeah, these kinds of things, uh, Bitcoin cannot fix that. Uh, a lot of um, what will come of Bitcoin uh, may be able to fix that. When Pacific nations become little Dubois, then yeah, even though we're still categorised by the UN as SIDS, small island developing states, they have a section for us every September at the UN General Assembly in New York, all the SIDS have their own little functions. Uh, hopefully we'll gradually make it back into the main forum where we discuss things with everyone else and not just sent off to the children's table. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, so you those... 200 billion, I don't think it will be. Yeah, that's right. I know, right? So hopefully those kinds of things uh, will change over time. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, we really appreciate your time. We could go on and on, Paris. Um, uh, what a fascinating use case. As Faris said at the very beginning, sometimes Paris and I talk about the theory of Bitcoin, you know, store of money, method of payment, whatever. But to see it in actual action and the potentials, really? I mean, this, this, this is really what Bitcoin's about. It's not about yeah. someone yeah. in Manhattan, New York, just doing Forex training on Binance or whatever. Exactly. It's actually boots on the ground stuff. So it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. When... Um, I forget which interview it was. Jack Mallis was talking about being in El Salvador. He made friends with one of the young fishermen boys. And he was telling Jack, my father never had a bank account. My grandfather never had a bank account. I don't have a bank account. <laughs> but I've got a ledger and I've got Bitcoin. Yeah. I can now participate in our financial system. That's what it's about. Yeah, daily exactly. bank account. Yeah. Okay, very last question, I promise. Mm. When is the Tonga uh, Bitcoin Beach happening? <laughs> uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Beach can honestly happen at any time. It's um, most likely, it's most sensible to have after legal tender has passed mm. because um, we don't have uh, the infrastructure thinking off the top of my head because... Bitcoin Beach, I wouldn't necessarily want to be on my estate, obviously, not anywhere else. Uh, but my estate is not in a position infrastructurally to be able to pull off Bitcoin Beach right now. So uh, it will most likely be on the main island, uh, closer to the, one of the metropolitan areas and straight after the legal tender, I'd say. Yeah. So I do have one last question. Because you said there was never any English colonization in Tonga, does that mean there are no queues in Tonga? <laughs> Sorry, there are no what? Queues. Because <laughs> you never queues. had English. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the funny thing is, colonization is famously done with the gun or the Bible. So it wasn't done by the gun, but our king who modernised Tonga, uh, who promulgated our constitution, uh, one of the oldest in the world, actually, 1875, became a devout Christian. So we were Christianized by lower middle class English... Mm. Methodists, wasn't it? Methodists. Mm. So we have a law in Tonga still on the books which is illegal for a man to be in public shirtless over the age of 16. Hmm. 
Now, that's not Tongan culture because we never had any material, no cloth, cotton. We wore tarpa cloths around our waists and were shirtless. So that law is a direct input of British lower middle class Methodist modesty. So everyone fully clothed, mm. all the women, dresses to the wrists and to the ankles, completely covered, and men the same, very modest, um, all in black uh, Methodist ministerial suits, and the women in absolutely coverall long sleeve dresses. So, yeah, our culture was, what is known as Tongan culture now is a hybrid of traditional Tongan culture and the very strong influence of specifically Methodist Christianity. So our over, yeah, 1400 year long tattooing tradition uh, was outlawed in 1839. Uh, the missionaries drafted the, the piece of legislation which says all tattooing and other pagan festivals, blah, 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 blah. Because obviously we used to pray to our traditional gods shall be outlawed. So for thousands of years, we've been getting tattooed. The word tattoo comes from the word tatau, which is the Tongan and Samoan and Hawaiian and Maori word for tattoo. So we took on, if you talk to a Tongan who is, Tongan baby boomers about tattoos, they'll tell you tattoos are only for sailors and women of ill repute. So that's not a Tongan social moral. That's middle-class English Methodist mm. social values that we've taken on because um, tattooing is intrinsic to our culture. So as you can see, I was one of our uh, later generation in the 90s and in the 2000s uh, who reclaimed our tattooing tradition. So I'm covered uh, neck to wrist to waist to knee in our traditional tattoos. Wow. Uh, wow. Done the old way with the tap, tap, mm. tap, tap, tap. Yeah. 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 I've seen yeah. that. Yeah. No so, Bitcoin tattoos? You do have one, don't that you? That was a great question. Yeah. yeah. Finally, um, I was asked that before, actually. Yeah. So the clan that I belong to, all the lords similar to the Scottish Highlands and whatever, are grouped into clans. So the clan I belong to is like the round table with the royal guard that protects this current dynasty. So this current dynasty mm -hmm. is the same line for 1,200 years, but the current dynasty... Um, it's like movement from the House of Windsor to uh, the House of Windsor is an extension of the previous houses. So this dynasty, um, 1600s, we're the Royal Guard. So one of our duties was to oversee um, sound money. So to make sure that there's not uh, an inflationary supply of the goods that were traded. So we have a motif for sound money uh, wow. in Tonga. So if sound money, there is only one sound money and that's Bitcoin. That's so right. if that motif means sound money, then it obviously must mean Bitcoin. <laughs> Fantastic. Wow. That's really good. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's my... Uh, interpretation and i'm going to stick with it so. yeah you don't need one you don't need a bitcoin tattoo <laughs> yeah. yeah well this has so, been an absolute yeah. pleasure um lord and um, my pleasure guys. You know, we'd love to have you we'd love to have you on again in six months down the line see what's happening but uh, i will reach out to you tomorrow because yeah if, if you can use me or gordon anyway we would love mm, to absolutely love to yep. collaborate we're close by oh, we're in the region too so mm, yeah yeah i'm sure they're 100 down the line um, yeah, I will need to reach out for one reason or another. And like I said, man, you don't have to ask us twice. I'll, I'll definitely reach out. Whenever I'm in Melbourne or 
Daniel mm-hmm. Nelson and uh, Anita Feed. I don't know who to call. Absolutely. Oh, Absolutely. You're welcome here anytime. So are you, do you leave the hospital or are you stuck in the hospital? For no, I'm stuck in the hospital. Um, oh, man. But it's a rehab hospital, but it's, a, it's, it's two wings. So one is the rehab hospital. The other is like a hospice for mm. elderly people. So yeah. because elderly people are the highest risk of COVID, our whole facility yeah. is treated um, as oh, as COVID delicate. So yeah, I, I haven't, my mother uh, is about th- three streets away, mm. but I haven't seen her since July because we're not allowed in. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, oh, that's tough. Yeah. Wow. You got to do what you can. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to give you my so contact details. So, um, yeah, I work, look, I work alone, and this is what we're doing full time in Gordon. So, um, yeah. <laughs> if you ever need to choose, uh, I'll be in touch with you guys. I'm not sure how much you guys yeah. um, get involved with um, the community's uh, Twitter spaces or. Oh, we are involved. I just had a meetup here in Nelson. I'm going to be in Auckland in a few weeks' time, actually. I'm looking to host a meetup up there. Um, nice. This is what we're doing. Um, I, well, yeah, Zoom I in from the meetup, year. so we can have a chat. Well, absolutely, right? Okay. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. So I'm now, fairly I'll be in touch tomorrow. Yeah, go on. I'll get. I'll give What's you guys your the link. I'm really, um, just Lord for think... store on everything. Yeah, I'll right. take Twitter. Yeah. Okay. So I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll Twitter Spaces daily um, mm. with some of the thought leaders uh, in the community. Mm. Uh, should yeah. know be. Uh, Sailor comes in, McCormack comes in, Nick Carter, everyone comes in. So, yeah. Yeah, we've had those guys on the show. So, it's, uh, yeah, it's awesome. such a good yeah. community. Exactly. But, uh, um, so, no, we're keen to actually catch up with Samson now. So, we might, yeah. We'll, um, yeah. We'll yeah. Tell him to send me yeah. some more units. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. But I'll be in touch soon. So, I've got another Zoom That's call great. coming up. But, um, Thank you All very right, much for your time. Yeah. Thanks so much for your time. Really, really appreciate thank it. You, Paris. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, I enjoyed it thank thoroughly. You. Thank you very second. much. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for watching or listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, please like, subscribe, and share so we can spread this educational content to others like yourself. Visit bitcoinbasics.help. Disclaimer. Any content provided by CoinCompass is for educational and informational purposes only and is not investment, legal, tax, or any other professional advice. A qualified professional should be consulted before making any financial decisions. CoinCompass will at times recommend certain products, services, and technologies, but these are opinions based upon our own or podcast guests' experience and not endorsements. We take no liability for out-of-date or inaccurate information, software bugs, manufacturing errors, technology misuse, or issues involving third parties. Visit coincompass.com for more information and please contact us.